So I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this webinar on enhancing teaching and learning of physical activity in Irish medical programs. And um, before I keep speaking, I just want to highlight that you can access a live transcript of this webinar by selecting a CC at the bottom of your Zoom screen and selecting show subtitles. So as I'm sure everybody who's attending this webinar is aware, physical activity is uh, essential for improving our health and well-being. There's strong evidence that physical activity reduces our risk of developing non-communicable diseases, that it has a positive effect on mental health, and it can support us to um, participate in everyday activities, particularly as we age. And this, conversely, physical inactivity is a leading cause of mortality worldwide. Despite all of these benefits of physical activity, surveys in Ireland have consistently shown that most of the Irish population aren't meeting physical activity guidelines. It's essential that we get more people in Ireland active if we want to reduce the burden of chronic diseases and also reduce the demand on our health services. Research has shown us that um, if a doctor tells patients to be more active, they're more likely to be more active. However, there's also research that shows doctors often lack the skills, knowledge, and importantly, the confidence to promote physical activity to their patients. So the purpose of this webinar is to generate a discussion about how we can enhance teaching and learning of physical activity in Irish medical programs. Our speakers today are Professor Suzanne McDonough, who will be sharing um, information about implementing the exercises medicine on campus and the Healthy Campus initiatives at RCSI. Dr. Lisa Mellon will be sharing the experience of delivering a certificate in lifestyle medicine. Professor uh, uh, Anne Gates will be sharing and um, experiences from two projects in the UK and Ireland about embedding physical activity in undergraduate healthcare curricula. Orla McGowan from the HSE will be sharing information about the Making Every Contact Count framework. And Dhruv Jivan will be sharing information about a survey of medical graduates' knowledge and confidence when it comes to physical activity counselling. I'd ask you to save your questions until after our final speaker, and we'll have about 20 minutes at the end for a discussion. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'm gonna share a short video from the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning, who supported this webinar um, as part of the National Seminar Series. So our first speaker is Professor Suzanne McDonough, who's the head of the School of Physiotherapy at RCSI, and is also the lead for the Exercises Medicine on Campus and Healthy Campus initiatives at RCSI. So welcome, Suzanne. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Just unmuting there and getting ready to share my slides. So thank you very much. I don't think my slides are coming up at the moment, are they? Um, no, no, I'd say an end of slideshow. Okay, let me just go. I'm getting a message. Oh, no, it's actually, it's gone now. That's fine. Just let me skip to the beginning. Just bear with me for one second. I might just have to skip through them. 
Great, so you should see the first slide now. So um, thanks very much. I'm really pleased to be speaking at this um, important seminar. And what I'm going to be talking about in the next 10 minutes is shown in this slide here. And I'm going to start with what is exercise as medicine on campus and what's healthy campus, um, and then move on to where we are in our CSI with respect to these, and then just finish with a take home message. So I think for both of these initiatives, um, they really are. So both Healthy Campus and Exercise as Medicine on Campus are two separate but overlapping initiatives that are about embedding health and wellness into campus life and really supporting both the personal and the professional development of students, both medical students, but all the other healthcare professional uh, courses that exist in, in Irish universities. So starting then with exercise is medicine. So this is much longer standing than Healthy Campus. So it was launched uh, 15 years ago um, by the American College of Sports Medicine and the um, American Medical Association. And this was really in recognition, Jennifer's already mentioned this, but the overwhelming evidence that physical activity not only helps people to manage health conditions, but also can protect uh, people's health moving forward and prevent them from getting future comorbidity. And the mission of exercise medicine was to really recognize this and embed physical activity in a, as a vital spa, uh, sign in medical consultations in the same way, for example, blood pressure is or asking about weight or asking somebody about their smoking habits. And it started off as a um, an initiative to support healthcare professionals and, and medicine, medical doctors in particular, to embed physical activity in their healthcare consultations and measure and monitor it with their patients over time. And this initiative was very influential in leading to the publication of the first ever physical activity guidelines, so national guidelines in 2008. And these national guidelines were uh, a set of guidelines with a very clear message for the public and the general population about how much physical activity you needed to do on a daily or weekly basis to both manage and protect your health um, and um, have been very influential. And we know that obviously these, these first set of guidelines by the American College of Sports Medicine have then been developed further in individual countries. So we obviously have UK guidelines, we have Irish guidelines, and we have most recently the WHO guidelines for physical activity for health. So a more recent development then as part of exercise as medicine has been exercise as medicine on campus. And this really came about from the recognition that in order to change what healthcare practitioners were doing on the ground, that it was really important to start with their training. So if, if people, and Jennifer mentioned it, if, if people didn't have the training at an undergraduate level or they didn't have much confidence then in using it with their patients, it was going to be very hard to embed physical activity um, into healthcare practice. Um, and so exercises medicine on campus is really to help students in the first instance to understand the connection between exercise health and their own academic success, both when they're in college and then in their professional life. Um, and I know Anne will, will make mention of what happens when that doesn't happen and how detrimental it can be to the health of medical students and then qualified medical graduates, but also to provide them with a toolkit that they would have then to support their patients once they went into clinical practice. So exercise as medicine has a global presence and you can see this on the slide with the countries in green where there is an exercise as medicine um, initiative um, and then in terms of Ireland the this is a fairly recent development so an exercise as medicine a centre was set up in 2019, and this was led by colleagues in University of Limerick, and their aim was to support all higher institutions to register for exercise as medicine on campus, and then each individual institution um, is invited to uh, submit evidence about their activities that link to exercise as medicine on campus and to get recognition either at bronze, silver or gold levels. And since its inception, RCSI has been awarded silver status for the last two years. And this really is in recognition of what we're already doing in terms of embedding physical activity into campus activities. So you can see here, 
uh, it's opportunities for our students to and staff to participate in gym uh, and other physical activity opportunities as well as uh, educational acti activities. So in RCSI, we have a, a very successful My Health series, both for the public and for our students, which speaks to uh, lifestyle behaviors. And, and Lisa will talk more about this in her talk. And then other developments. So this is exercise prescription workshop was very much driven by the medical students who wanted to know more about how they would prescribe this to their patients. So Healthy Campus then is a much more recent initiative. So you can see here, this was launched by Simon Harris and Stephen Donnelly in July, 2021. And this has, is a much broader initiative. So uh, Exercise as Medicine on campus is very focused around physical activity, where Healthy Campus is focused on all health enhancing behaviors. So from stress management to um, healthy eating, to drug and alcohol and sexual practice. And it offers a set, a set of guidelines to third level institutions to help them to build on what they're already doing probably very well, but also then to help them to think about decisions about how they integrate the philosophy of healthy campus into their teaching and educational decisions. And I think it's really, I mean, we understand that in order to uh, embed uh, physical activity and other health behaviors, it needs to be a whole systems approach. So we need to be not just thinking about the health service, but we need to be thinking about the wider environment and the general public. Um, but thinking about universities as this, as a mini ecosystem where we can identify social and academic opportunities to embed health behaviors into our university environments. And certainly in our CSI, we have a well-established REACH program. So we're based within a city centre um, and very local to some um, areas of, of need in terms of health, um, quite deprived areas. Um, and so our REACH uh, program will very much fit within the Healthy camp Campus initiatives moving forward. So then where are we uh, in our CSI with respect to these um, two developments? We're about to launch a new medical curriculum in September. Uh, there's been a huge amount of planning has gone into this. So uh, nearly six years of planning to uh, design a curriculum that not only produces excellent medical uh, graduates, but also supports them in their own health and well-being to build their character uh, and well-being and uh, personal identity. So this, and Lisa will mention this as well, but it's very much based around the Carnegie framework of the head being the knowledge you need uh, in medical school, the skills, uh, the hands representing the skills you need to develop, and then the heart really around the uh, professional and personal identity that you need to develop both uh, when you're in college, but also moving forward when you're working um, as a medical graduate. And so the idea of this is that we're able to enhance the students well being not only through the educational content that we would do so the academic and skills content, but also through uh, physical and social opportunities. Um, and then actually through the process of education itself so helping the students uh, develop and build their resilience and their uh, personal identity in the hope that this will then, or the aspiration that this will help them then to support their patients moving forward when they move into clinical practice. So we are at the moment over the summer going to be doing a scoping exercise. We're fairly early days with our RCSI Healthy Campus. So we're harnessing our uh, student engagement and partnership um, uh, program. So we will have two step, step students working on eight week projects over the summer and they'll be working in partnership with myself but also with all of the schools so medicine physiotherapy and pharmacy and the center for positive health to map out what we're currently doing uh, to look at frameworks uh, for education that enhance health and well-being and protect the health of our students and then we'll move to a wider consultation and write our action plan uh, in the next academic year so just to finish then with the take-home message then um, I think what's important is that there is recognition that universities in themselves are important ecosystems that can be health promoting. Um, and certainly in RCSI, we are working hard to develop educational environments that will support the students' health uh, on a 
personal level, but also prepare them to be future change agents for health and well-being moving forward. And hopefully help us to meet our aspiration in RCSI to lead the world to better health. Um, and happy to take questions at the end of this session. So thanks very much, Jennifer. Thanks very much, Suzanne. So the next speaker we have is Dr. Lisa Mellon, who is a lecturer in psychology at RCSI and is a lifestyle medicine practitioner. And Lisa will be sharing the experience of delivering a certificate in lifestyle medicine at RCSI. Can you see my slides, Jennifer? Um, yes, yeah, so I was just waiting for your camera to come on. And, yeah, we can see your slides. They're not in slideshow view yet, though. OK. I did the classic thing there of uh, being on mute. Uh, <laughs> <by mistake. laughs> yeah, we can Hello. see you perfectly now. Thanks. For Lovely. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, for this seminar. And what I'd like to do is take you through the RCSI Certificate in Lifestyle Medicine, uh, give you a sense of what this involves and how it's part of our educational goals to equip our um, future healthcare professionals to uh, holistically treat chronic disease by using lifestyle medicine as part of their treatment plans. So I'll take you on a short journey of what we currently do, um, what the Lifestyle Medicine Certificate is and how that fits into what we do, and then feedback on the students who have completed the course in terms of how they found it and how we could refine it uh, for the next cohorts. So for the past three to four years, we have um, delivered behaviour change counselling skills workshops to our students across all of our cohorts in RCSI. Uh, and I suppose our key message in these workshops is that giving information, so telling, judging or advising your patient, largely does not equal behaviour change. And there's lots of research evidence to support this. So in our workshops, we try and um, we teach students skills. Uh, the workshops are based on the motivation interviewing framework. So we give students the tools of motivation interviewing uh, in the workshops. We do role plays amongst students and give them case studies to work through. And we give feedback in terms of staff feedback and peer feedback so they can learn to have, how to improve their communication skills. Across the cohorts in undergraduate medicine, this is embedded in smoking cessation training, where they learn about pharmacotherapy interventions for smoking cessation, and also how to deliver a brief intervention for smoking cessation based on motivation interviewing. In our graduate entry medicine cohort in year one, we do a more general behavior change skills workshop. Again, where we go through motivation interviewing and they apply this to general health risk behaviors like smoking, alcohol, drugs, physical inactivity, nutrition, medication adherence, and so on. Uh, in physiotherapy, we do a little bit more in terms of we deliver this motivation interviewing workshop, but we also bring students into the simulation lab where they meet um, a simulated patient uh, and they deliver a brief intervention. We then show them the videos back after class and they get both staff and peer feedback uh, on this. They're not graded on this, but it's a very useful learning experience for them. And the cases in the, in the simulation lab would largely be physical activity cases. And finally, in pharmacy, in year five, we deliver again the motivation interviewing uh, workshop and we bring them into the simulation lab also. The case studies will be wider than physical activity and more perhaps relevant to pharmacy like uh, alcohol, uh, drug use, medication adherence and so on. Uh, and again, they, they actually are graded on this as part of their final year internship in pharmacy. So that's what we currently do, but we felt that lifestyle medicine would give the students more theory in terms of how they can have that holistic mindset when they're treating patients. So you might ask, well, what is lifestyle medicine? It's very much an emerging medical specialty. So it's not an interest, it's actually a specialism within medicine, which uses therapeutic lifestyle interventions as the first line treatment for diseases such as cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, and obesity. It's obviously not limited to these, but these are the main ones that it's applied to. Importantly, lifestyle medicine is evidence-based and it takes a whole person approach uh, to developing treatment plans in terms of preventing, managing or reversing uh, conditions such as type 2 diabetes, which is reversible. 
within lifestyle medicine, it's based on six pillars that are involved in treatment. And those six pillars are nutrition in terms of a plant-based diet, physical activity, uh, sleep, stress management, substance use in terms of smoking, alcohol, drugs, and also positive social connections. And this, I suppose, drive to make lifestyle medicine a specific medical specialty came from the US and was largely championed by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. It's now spreading, I suppose, worldwide uh, across Europe and so on. And it really is becoming, we have lifestyle medicine practitioners and physicians in Ireland and internationally. So back to our certificate in lifestyle medicine and RCSI, I'm sure those of you involved in education can appreciate that a medical curriculum or a physiotherapy curriculum or a pharmacy curriculum are jam-packed and it's very hard to get space for new material within those curricula. So we wanted to bring this in quite quickly. So what we did was we developed a certificate in lifestyle medicine that was an optional add-on for students to do in conjunction with their core academic content. So they could opt in to do this uh, in their own time. Uh, the aims of this were twofold. So we wanted to give them evidence-based knowledge and practical strategies to firstly help them to be healthier. So give them uh, or instill healthy lifestyle behaviors for themselves, and then to use this knowledge to support their future patients uh, in their future practice in terms of helping them to implement healthy lifestyle behaviors and ultimately uh, treat or, or prevent chronic disease development. So just take you through what the actual certificate looked like. Uh, in terms of structure, it was 50, 50 to 60 hours of online content. So it was fully online course. Um, so each pillar had about maybe eight to 10 hours, depending on the pace the student wanted to move through the material on. Within each pillar, there was assessments and knowledge checks built into the presentations uh, to make sure that students weren't just clicking through all of the slides. Um, and for each pillar, the students had to complete a personal reflection. And this was based on the Gibbs cycle of reflection, where the student had to reflect on the experience of learning on this pillar, their feelings and thoughts towards it, and how they might create an action plan moving forward with their new learning. These were short reflective pieces, and I'll give an example of one uh, in a moment. And then the chunk of the assessment was a final assignment where they had to make a personal lifestyle change or try to make a change for two weeks uh, and then reflect on what helped or didn't help them to make this change so the barriers and facilitators to change uh, in tandem with this they also had to do a critical appraisal of the literature of the evidence of or supporting evidence for this uh, behavior in terms of lifestyle and impact on health and also review the guidelines for whatever chosen behavior it was so they picked using the paving wheel which is a questionnaire to help you identify what part of your lifestyle needs most attention and that's how they picked what behavior they'd focus on in their assignment in terms of timeline and assessment of the certificate it was run in parallel to their academic courses. So they were given the material in October. So one pillar was released every three weeks. So there were six pillars and each pillar was open for a six week block. So this allowed them to work through the material over six weeks uh, and then it ended at the six weeks and they didn't have access to it. So it kept them engaged, but also didn't pressure them to do a lot of content all at once. And as I've spoken about uh, for the assessment piece, they had to complete all of the online content for each of the six pillars. They had to complete the quizzes, which were embedded in the presentations, and they had to complete a personal reflection for each uh, of the pillars. Now, you can imagine if we had 150 students multiply that by six, that's a lot of correcting of assignments. And we didn't have the, the manpower to do that from a staff level. So we picked two reflections at random and we graded these. And because it was an optional certificate, we graded it as pass or not yet. And then the final piece, the, the larger assignment on personal behavior change was key to the assessment. So if a student did all six personal reflections, but didn't do the assignment at the end, they wouldn't pass the certificate. So this was a core part to get them to apply their knowledge. And I suppose to recognize the difficulties that patients experience in changing their behavior. Just to give you a sense of what it looked like, this is just a screenshot from our virtual learning platform in Moodle. You can see all the pillars laid out there and you can see that there's a progress bar so students could assess how they were uh, progressing and what pillar maybe they needed to catch up on and so on. 
uh, I myself developed and delivered the physical activity pillar. So just to give you a sense of what was in this. And again, you know, we had to tailor it towards about eight hours of content, including um, different quizzes and um, tasks within each lecture. So there was three sessions. The first session was an introduction to physical activity and health. The second one was measuring physical activity. So measuring their own and others. And then session three was actually how do they change physical activity behavior? So models of behavior change and so on, setting SMART goals and things like that. The format of the lectures were um, interact or so was live recorded lectures uh, with the lecturer in the corner um, delivered through Panopto. Uh, and again, it was all online and there was no real time access to staff. I'll come to that as a limitation uh, in, in a few minutes. Just to give you a sense of uh, different resources that uh, I presented for them in this pillar and then coming to the reflective assignment, you can see they were given choice on this. So depending on whether they were physically active or physically inactive, they could pick to reflect on uh, my reflections on the importance of physical activity in my life or my reflections on the barriers to being physically active in my life. And it was about a thousand word assignment, so not too big. And, you know, no references were needed. It was a self-reflected piece. So to the final part then, you know, what did students think of this? This was very much a test case. This was the first iteration of this certificate. And we wanted to know if our educational strategy met the needs of the students. So in 2020, 171 students enrolled and 133 completed it. So we're very pleased with this completion rate, given that it was an optional certificate. And of those completions, we asked them to complete a survey and we got very detailed responses um, and a very high response rate again, which really helped us to figure out what worked and what didn't work. So for the purposes of this presentation, I pulled out the main themes that was in uh, the feedback to, to reflect on this was the success of the certificate. The first question we asked them was, did you change any of your behaviours after the completing the lifestyle medicine course? And, very, I suppose, encouragingly, nearly all reported that they tried to change health behaviour. So they were trying to apply the, the theory that they were learning. And just looking at physical activity uh, specifically for the, the audience on this webinar, uh, we found that absolutely there was change. So um, looking at some of the quotes we got, uh, one student reported that I went through phases of different changes as the module went by and my physical activity has stuck with me out of all. Uh, one student reported becoming uh, more actively or more regularly exercising rather than being a weekend warrior. And I think that third quote there, my physical activity was poor, but after doing my final project on it, my attitude to physical, uh, physical activity has changed quite a bit. So the learning that they had motivated them to change. And that was very much the point of the, the course and its, its aims. So that was physical activity uh, specifically. But what I noticed was that physical activity um, change tended to co-occur with other behavior change. And I think this speaks to the fact that when we're teaching physical activity, we can't just teach it in isolation. Um, changing in other, other lifestyle behaviors can support physical activity change in tandem because they are so interlinked in a person's environment. So one student said, I've integrated more exercise, positive self-talk and better nutrition in my everyday life. Or I found the information in the stress and physical activity pillar really influenced my behaviors. So what we see is physical activity in isolation largely wasn't changing. There was just a general lifestyle improvement overall, which again falls under that lifestyle medicine framework. If we think of aim one of the certificate, which was to help students to improve their own health, uh, what we found as a strong theme that students really self-evaluated their own behaviour. And the first quote is very interesting. The assignments allowed me to analyse if I was actively practising what I plan on preaching. So that's very much a self-reflective piece there. Uh, the third quote there really stood out for me. You know, so often we learn about unhealthy habits of future patients. However, so many of us possess those same patients or those same habits. So recognizing that they themselves might be future patients and what they can do for their own selves. And interestingly, one person reported, I believe last time I mentioned it should be mandatory. Many of us get caught up in studying health and forget the importance of our own health. So separating out their role as a doctor, but also their role to themselves to show up for themselves in terms of managing their own health. And the last quote, 
for me uh, in psychotherapy, one of the metaphors we use is, you know, if you're on an airplane and the safety demonstration says, in case of an emergency, put on your own oxygen mask first and then help those around you. I think this quote maps onto this in terms of it taught me the importance of improving my own health before I aim to go into a field that aims to help others with their health. So recognizing that they need to have their own house in order in order to have the ability and the, the vision to help other people change behavior. Then the second aim of the certificate was to prepare students for future practice. And what stood out in the feedback was the word holistic. It was mentioned a lot. And these are just some of the quotes that spoke to that. Uh, so students recognized that holistic patient management was important. And if I hark back to what I said about one of our key messages in RCSI and teaching this kind of stuff is that we want them to learn that information giving is not the best strategy for changing behavior. The evidence doesn't support that. A more holistic approach is key. And I think these quotes speak to the fact that students really got that. So one student said there, I feel this course will be beneficial for any healthcare practitioner, would allow for more holistic management of patients. And I want to approach my patients with a holistic mindset. Uh, and the last quote there again, really shows us that students, I suppose, maybe those who were a bit dubious about the importance of lifestyle before they did the course actually recognize, well, actually this does have value and quite a lot of value in my practice. So I learned so much more about lifestyle habits than I thought I would. It shows you the importance of holistic care and what an impact it can have on people's lives. So that's very much meeting our aims of preparing them to use this content in their future practice. And again, on that theme, you know, how do they envisage that they will actually use this? Uh, I think, again, what I said, they know now that um, the most effective interventions are multi-component, not just information giving or very, you know, directive advice. So the first quote there, as I progress through my career, I know I can't simply turn to the patient and say exercise more or eat better. I need to help them create a more actionable plan to help them better achieve lifestyle behaviours. Uh, and secondly, there before this, addressing lifestyle as medicine would have been very far down my list of counselling points with a patient. And some of these students were on the wards on clinical placements and would have done assessments with patients. So this is really encouraging to hear that they were self-reflecting on what they were doing and how this would need to be modified. And then the last two quotes there really spoke to the fact that students recognize that maybe medicine isn't the first line treatment uh, when we look at chronic disease or disease in general. So one student quoted, it really made me see beyond the world of drugs, drugs, drugs as medicine. And this course gave me the tools to treat patients by making lifestyle changes rather than through medication or in addition to medication. I'm much more knowledgeable on the importance of lifestyle for disease prevention. So, Based on those quotes, I think we're very much meeting the aims that we set out to do, particularly helping them to manage or, or be more reflective on the importance of their own health. But secondly, how they can integrate this knowledge into their future practice. And what we hope to do is create a new wave of healthcare professionals who will prioritize that lifestyle treatment approach uh, or holistic management rather than a biomedical model approach that they would take a more biopsychosocial approach and I know Drew our student speaker at the end will talk about what current um, um, I suppose early stage career doctors how skilled they feel uh, and what we're doing now is to try and create that new wave and instill this in their practice as, as mandatory um, when they get out on the wards and you know enter the workforce. So this was an educational initiative. So we wanted to see if our approach or if our modality actually met the students' needs. So I'm just going to talk briefly about what they thought of the delivery of the course rather than what they got out of it, which I've just presented. So we asked them if they felt the online mode of delivery was good or if they if that mode of delivery worked for them. And 89% said it was very good or excellent, which was positive to hear. The key things that came out in terms of positive feedback was that they really appreciated the ability to access content in their own time. So they didn't have to show up at any time or place to learn this. Uh, and that there were space deadlines would allow them to better manage their time in terms of managing their other core academic demands and also this course. 
Uh, in terms of feedback for what we could do better, um, some of them flagged that it was quite isolating uh, to just be online and that some interactive webinars with staff would be very useful. So uh, perhaps one uh, interactive webinar per pillar to allow them to ask questions, which is a very good suggestion and something I myself would advocate for. And also a discussion forum. So again, there will be that social connection with other students where they could ask questions and share resources and so on. So they're very um, useful suggestions to how we could improve the, the delivery of the course. Then looking at the assignments, we asked them how prepared they feel for the assignment based on the materials they had, and 84% said it was very good or excellent. They found the assignment personally challenging, but in a good way, which was good to hear in terms of the learning they got out of it. They liked that they weren't told what behaviour to focus on, that they could pick whatever behaviour they wanted to look at, and there, there were six different behaviours they could pick from. And also for the critical appraisal piece that they had uh, good library resources within the RCSR library in terms of access to online journals and, and so on. Um, feedback they gave in terms of what could be better was that they asked for sample examples of reflection. They didn't know what the gold standard was for reflection. So they wanted to see what was expected of them. And this was a very good point. And because it was the first cohort, we didn't have a sample example, but we can do that now with future cohorts because we have um, reflections corrected. So I suppose just to summarize, what did we learn uh, from uh, this iteration of the RCSI certificate in lifestyle medicine. Students reported that a mental health pillar would be important and was something they wanted. So one thing we didn't include here was the social connectedness pillar. So I think we need to, to go back and develop a more targeted mental health pillar and include this in the certificate. They also asked for a sexual health pillar. And this is something that's not covered by uh, lifestyle medicine in general, but I, I do believe it is something that should be included and it's something the students want. So we, we will look into that as well. They get some of that training in their core curriculum, but they wanted more information. As I said, they wanted live sessions with staff. They wanted midway feedback on the reflections to see if they were meeting that standard. So again, we can do that. They wanted a group discussion forum. And lastly, uh, you know, coordinator support is key. You know, uh, there can be a lot of technical hitches and questions around deadlines and so on. So we had a coordinator who uh, managed this and the students really, really appreciated that there any queries were gotten back to within 24 hours. So they felt very much supported in their learning. Just, I suppose, tying in with what Professor McDonough pre presented and how does this fit in with medical education in general? Well, again, the, the framework that we use in RCSI is on the three apprenticeships of learning. So knowledge, skills and personal and professional identity. So head, hands and heart. And we feel that the certificate in lifestyle medicine contributes to each of those pillars of medical education and healthcare education in general, because, again, this was not just for medical students. It was for physiotherapy and pharmacy students as well. So in terms of the head, our knowledge pillar, the academic content provided them with that learning piece. Uh, for the skills pillar, we feel that this certificate in lifestyle medicine coupled with the behaviour change skills um, or the behaviour change counselling skills teaching we do, which I discussed at the beginning, those combined give them the theory and the skills practice to prepare them as future change agents in health and wellbeing in healthcare. And then lastly, but probably more importantly, um, we feel it taps into the personal and professional identity pillar. So by incorporating lifestyle medicine into their own lives, we're building resilience for them to prioritize their own health. Firstly, in a very pre pressurized academic environment that they're currently in, and then also in the very pressurized uh, professional environment they will move into and how that they can always prioritize their own health within that. So this really feeds into that personal professional identity development. Uh, so just to, to summarise then, this quote I wanted to share really stood out for me uh, in that we really met our aims of our, um, uh, I suppose, the certificate uh, with this student in particular. So this lifestyle medicine pillar didn't just inform me on the betterment of the lives of my future patients, but it changed my perspective on many things in my life that I underappreciate in terms of their contribution to my health. 
I believe that I've made small lifestyle changes and I am better and healthier for it because of this certificate. So, you know, this, this to me, this is a good day in the office in that we met our objectives that the student uh, reflected on their own health needs, but also how this could be useful for them uh, in their future career. Just to acknowledge the course team who developed and delivered this uh, the certificate in lifestyle medicine. This was led by Professor Anne Hickey, who's the head of the health psychology department in RCSI. Uh, our linchpin of the entire thing was our coordinator, Neve Corbett. And then members of the Department of Health Psychology and Dr. Grace O'Malley from the physiotherapy uh, school, uh, we developed and delivered the co uh, content on the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. And while I'll have you here, I'm going to take the opportunity to give a shameless plug to the uh, Irish Society of Lifestyle Medicine. So this was set up by a group of interested healthcare practitioners in Ireland who have sat an exam that was developed by the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine, which on completion of this exam, uh, you become a lifestyle medicine physician or a lifestyle medicine practitioner. So we've set up a, a special interest group. We meet uh, on the last Tuesday of every month and we have educational seminars from within our own membership, but also with invited guest speakers. We would love new members who are interested in lifestyle medicine and who work in healthcare. We're hosting a MedCafe event on the 30th of June, uh, which will be a webinar. Uh, where we will have guest speakers, uh, hopefully international speakers, who will talk, uh, I suppose, to introduce our group to lifestyle medicine and the research in that. So if you'd like to join our mailing list, uh, my email is there. Please come, feel free to contact me or also just drop us a message on our Twitter page. Uh, it's down there at the end. So uh, all members are welcome. Please do uh, reach out to us. So thank you. I'll hand you back to Jennifer now. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, our next speaker is Anne Gates, who is an honorary associate professor at the University of Nottingham and a visiting professor at uh, Plymouth Marjon University. She was also selected for the World Heart Federation Emerging Leaders Program and, cert and is a certified NHS change agent. Uh, so I'll hand over to Anne. We can't see your slides just yet. You can't? Uh, no, not yet. Um, I've shared. Hold on a second, then. Um, uh, yeah, we can see them. We can see them now. Yeah, it's not in. It's not in slideshow view yet. But we no, I'm just sorry. Yeah. I don't <laughs> quite know what happened there because I'd had it already. Can you can you just confirm that you can see the slides now and hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah they look perfect. Thank you. OK, thank you. Welcome, everybody, and especially to any international participants that are joining us. Uh, my name's Anne Gates, and uh, thank you, Jennifer, for uh, already introducing me. Um, I'd just like to say that my NHS experience also included being a director of strategic planning in the NHS and also uh, head of health strategy uh, at a regional health organisation uh, for the NHS. So today I'm very much uh, wanting to talk about why it's critically important that physical activity um, is incorporated into undergraduate medical and health curriculars with evidence from the UK and the European Union Erasmus uh, Vanguard project. Uh, so I'd like to just give a little bit of history of why we're here and what we've um, uh, developed and implemented. But um, I came about this really from the concept of me being a clinical pharmacist and looking towards holistic um, care models and, and also str uh, strategic and cultural change models. Um, so um, my background is developing services as well. And when I started to look at the value and the role of uh, physical activity, not only in prevention, uh, but treatment and rehabilitation, and obviously in active leisure uh, and, and sport activities, we decided to approach this very, very differently and mobilize the healthcare workforce. So to give you some context to that, the NHS healthcare workforce sees um, 1.3 million uh, people every uh, 24 to 36 hours. There's a workforce of 700,000 people in the NHS 
across the United Kingdom. And we felt that that was a model for at scale change in mobilizing the professionals to move nations and ultimately move the lives of their patients and their community. Now we set this up very differently because we wanted to work as a community of practice, uh, which is a very different model of um, development and implementation. So we had over 150 authors that uh, were responsible for um, supplying um, evidence-based uh, um, uh, uh, resources. Uh, those resources were collated and assessed and went through 100 peer reviewers and 50 student reviewers. Um, and I can't stress this enough, particularly in undergraduate medical education and, and healthcare education. It was really brought to life by working together with patients with non-communicable diseases or NCDs for short and patient groups and held together through that value of the collective experiences in what patients felt they needed to know within a clinical consult. And, and so we set about, and we first started in 2010, and then this was really realized in 2014, around delivering the change across the educational systems, but specifically future healthcare professionals, the educational cultures, e.g. universities, to improve the knowledge and skills um, in the future healthcare workforce. So why did we do this? Well, because the World Health Organization has produced a global goal to reduce physical inactivity. And to be very clear, and, and, and the other speakers have alluded to this and will do, um, physical inactivity um, kills people. Um, and also it predisposes them to other non-communicable diseases. And the burden of that, and we only need to look at that, how non-communicable diseases fed into the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the challenges on the healthcare systems, uh, to recognise that the World Health Organisation were ahead of its time in very clearly saying we need to reduce inactivity by 10% by 2025 and adding a second layer of reducing inactivity in child and adolescent health by 15%. However, the UK is unlikely to meet the 10% target by 2025. So I'll just leave that thought with you. So is physical activity as brief advice, brief interventions effective? Yes, it's a very good choice for clinicians as a health message within the consult and the day-to-day -day activities, either in hospital, in primary care, or in their communities. So just to give you some examples of how effective it is in terms of time and cost effectiveness and outcomes, and these are numbers needed to treat, to get one patient who smokes to give up cigarettes, doctors need to advise 50 to 120 patients. To get one inactive patient to meet to meet recommended activity levels, doctors need to advise just 12. Now, I'm sure you're all aware of the pressures on the national health system in the United Kingdom. And in fact, you know, if you're looking at our daily activity within the healthcare service, that has potential to almost reach six patients. So to move patients that are hitherto inactive or don't understand the value of physical activity, everyday activity, within their day-to-day -day lives, that makes it very, very good medicine. And that's why it's really important to make every contact count for physical activity. And actually we use the Health Service um, Island um, videos around making every contact count. So we have synergy uh, across that and also synergy across all the European Union uh, member states because they've got very similar healthcare systems. So is it good medicine? Yes. We also came at this, um, I mean, I've been an educator for a long time and um, we were very concerned that um, higher uh, educational institutes um, accept the brightest and the best within our medical and healthcare uh, student cohorts. And we were very much aware that not only physical activity levels were dropping, but also the very important well-being, and I know uh, Suzanne mentioned this um, in, in her presentation. We know that mental health is a big issue for um, student doctors. 
We also know that meeting the guidance is likely to result in less emotionally exhausted students and for students to actually have a higher quality of life. But also really important that we know that those students that are less stressed and partake in regular physical activity are much more likely to um, be good advocates and uh, initiate conversations around physical activity with their patients and their local communities. And I just want to flag up, you'll see at the bottom, there's a little pile of books. So throughout the entire resources, we have different icons and different connected and interwoven themes, references, and access to other resources. And I've just included them here um, uh, on each slide as well. And to me, this is a real Houston, we have a massive global problem. We have a massive national problem. So this is based on some research that was done relatively recently, where 80% of English primary care doctors were unfamiliar with a physical activity guidance. And quite shockingly, and this figure represents a range of, a global range of between 13 to 20%, um, across the physiotherapy um, uh, global uh, 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 knowledge, that only 16% of UK physiotherapists knew all the three elements of the physical activity guidance. Now, when we started to unpick this as um, educators, but also working very closely with the World Health Organization Europe, it was clear that the language used um, within consults was way too complicated. And I'll just say, I mean, part of my expertise um, in communication is around physical literacy and the average reading age in Derbyshire, which is where I live uh, and, and previously worked, is between seven to eight year olds. So we felt, well, the WHO was very keen to slim down the language into bite sight bite-sized meaningful messaging. So their messaging and all the strap lines for the World Health Organization and the World Health Organization New Europe, and indeed in the UK, is to be active. Some exercise is good, more is better. So that sort of nudge philosophy, building strength and balance is incredibly important. And to obviously talk and raise about minimizing sedentary time and inactivity. But most importantly, to connect with um, the support around um, patients and individuals so that they could, it's something that they could either do in isolation or share with friends and family. And so the entire resource set was built uh, along those premises. But also um, in 2018, we had a commission with Public Health England to visit um, 16 university medical schools. Um, and to develop a framework for embedding physical activity in the curriculum, which we did, and to provide scene setting presentations specifically around the UK Chief Medical Officer's infographics and the physical activity recommendations, not only in the UK, but specifically the World Health Organization, and enable really bespoke discussions with curricular leads but, and also the deans of medicine and health and also to champion best practice, which I'll, I'll highlight in a bit. But the main thing is, is this theme of reducing inequity in the physical inactivity awareness. And this has been um, highlighted very clearly with WHO um, and actually forms a key theme in the development of the Movement for Movement resources. Um, were we pleased with the reception? Yes, we were absolutely delighted. This is um, a quote very kindly from Dr. Sarah Hansen, who's a lecturer in nursing sciences at the University of East Anglia, who said it's critical that health staff are trained. Um, the movement for movement resources are excellent, and it's a great aid to universities who are adding physical activity to their curriculum. Um, and indeed, this is a photograph with on the far right with uh, Dr. Sarah Hansen leading a cohort of students and literally walking the talk, getting, getting them to measure their pulse rate and understand the effects on their blood pressure and everything else. But I've got two UK exam exemplars. Um, the University of East Anglia is a very well-established practice-based learning um, approach to medical education. 
So our resources were integrated um, across a wide plethora of usual medical um, uh, modules. Um, and as most importantly, was being considered for actual physical activity and assessment and counselling in the OSCE exams, which um, the University of East Anglia does lead on. And we're also looking across not just medicine, but nursing, occupational therapy, excuse me, paramedic science, physiotherapy and speech and language therapy. And a lot of the universities that we realise that we visited realise the aspiration that all of our resources fit very nicely with interprofessional learning, but also leadership, um, very similar to the aspirations at RCSI, but linking into developing world leaders of the future as well. Um, I have to give a shout out to Lancaster University Medical School because on our um, uh, uh, English uh, medical school visits, they got the gold medal. They won it hands down. And so uh, any presentation wouldn't be appropriate without really singing their praises. They already had a suitable e-platform. I mean, all our resources can be loaded up to any platform. Um, and they highlighted these per problem based learning scenario. So they also had a very well established um, uh, practice based learning scenario that was disease led and indeed our resources are disease, non communicable disease, equity, social determinants led, which fits very nicely with the way that they're teaching medical students at the moment. Um, the delivery was um, around uh, set physical activity learning outcomes. And any any one to one lectures was delivered by the exercise scientists. And there's a slight change here um, with our Vanguard projects that I'm going to talk about next. Uh, but also they're developing physical activity related content specifically for the exams. Uh, and uh, Dr. Michelle Swainson is a lead on this. So on the back of this work done in 2018, we were very fortunate to be given a grant for 400,000 euros, um, which was entitled the Vanguard Erasmus Project. And uh, that was in conjunction with um, WHO Europe, the European Union, and specifically five European Union member states. The reason why we called it Vanguard is because Vanguard comes from the French, which is, means avant-garde, and we felt that this moved the day-to-day -day consults concept into actually leading in the future, not only on the, the patient contacts, but also strengthening the systems which the WHO Global Action Plan for Physical Activity uh, decrees. And Vanguard stands for virtual, i.e. online, providing the concepts for advice, but also nurturing the best and brightest of our uh, of our students, i.e., you know, the medical students and the school uh, and, and the school of health students, to give the the recommended guidance and to mobilise universal action. So everybody, whatever their healthcare professional qualifications, and also to support you know future research questions and the and and, and the development of physical activity. Um, we are delighted that the member states were Lithuania, France, Estonia, Portugal and Greece, with Wolverhampton at that stage being a lead. Um, and the principal investigator is Professor George Metsios, who is now a professor of exercise sciences at the University of Thessaly. So as you can see from here, this, this presentation, we were already consolidating work within the United Kingdom. So Vanguard moves us to connect very closely with not only the healthcare systems, but the healthcare educational systems across the EU with our ultimate aspiration for our, our resources to be adopted by the World Health Organization and also to have an international online discussion forum led by global academics around physical activity uh, and, the, and its importance in, in, uh, in society. Um, I'm very naughty because I'm showing you these. Um, we've on Friday, I'm just about to submit with my colleagues from Vilnius University, Lithuania. Um, and I'm afraid I couldn't, I couldn't behave. So this is pre-publication, totally confidential. So this slide is not for sharing outside the webinar, please, um, on our initial results. So um, we've got an implementation project, but it's part of Professor George Metzios's um, 
uh, research project um, and, and we asked the students at Vilnius University, which comprised of medical students, uh, but also a predominant cohort of nursing students, how they rated the clarity of the materials for movement for movement with a, a, a survey size of 246. And the mean of that is 4.7 uh, uh, out of five as a score. And do you think the information learned in the movement for movement lectures can be used in your professional uh, activities and practices? So we were trying to get a link between the education and applicability within their professional career. And again, those scored very highly. I want to pause for a second because the movement for movement resources are predominantly in English. So this is proof of concept that they are translatable and transferable to European member states, um, which, ports, which forms part of our dissemination problem, uh, the project for um, the Movement for Movement and Vanguard projects, but also um, highlights the differences between each, each member union, uh, member states, which we wanted to harness. So Estonia are going to translate into Estonian, um, and um, uh, Greece is going to use the English language. Um, and we, we know that three out of the cohort are going to be successful. And at this moment, France and Portugal, mainly because of the COVID uh, epidemic, um, are still aiming uh, uh, to be successful within the project. So we approach this in terms of strategic leadership and cultural change. So. Did change agency feature right from the very start? Yes, because of my expertise in um, strategic planning, but also to embed, to embed physical activity concepts within the very DNA of our, of our work practices. Um, and for students to really grasp this right at the first stage. Is this critically important? Yes, because I felt that one of the barriers and one of the failures of physical activity within every consult is, and, and as part of physical activity is a vital sign, is the fact that we don't put it in the same emphasis as learning advanced lifestyle skills or, you know, CPR inductions run across the NHS. And so, you, you know, you begin to ask yourself, well, why not? Because it's life-saving medicine. It has potential to transform people's lives in a way that medicines and technologies might not. So we're very clear that change agency and the practice and assessment of skills and the impact from the bedside clinical uh, environments to, to also NHS, you know, trust boardroom um, and societal boardroom influence is really, really important. Um, and I have to play this because um, some of our designers were, were very keen to introduce just that little DNA. So this revolving is indicative also of fitting in spiral curriculums within um, universities. And the purpose of this model is to strengthen the knowledge, competence, capabilities and confidence as per the World Health Organization's um, advice. So just to be very clear, our preferred model of implementation within the curricula is for clinicians. So lead oncologists, cardiologists, um, care of the elderly specialists to lead on the student cohort um, tutorials and if necessary, didactic um, learning. And um, I'll, I'll draw on some of the comments from that uh, uh, later on. But the other thing is the movement for movement resources came about through the power and the psychology of social movement theory. So the first word movement is reliant on social movement theory. And we wanted to mobilize not only the workforce, but specifically the students to become advocates of change. So in terms of social movement theory. So the movement for movement, was came about in 2015 and predominantly we wanted to avoid the terms exercise and physical activity and resistance exercises and all that because basically patients don't understand that really easily in a short brief intervention and we wanted to remove some of the semantics and some of the befuddlement that who has now identified around the language that we use in a patient consult. So we have also determined that we felt that we wanted to engage students on understanding that this is a 
this is their lifetime job. So we've got essential criteria and desirable criteria, i.e. what's the very basic that they should know. And it became clear and, and, and um, uh, the other uh, uh, speakers alluded to this in as much as we wanted to be very, very clear about the role of leadership in all contexts, societal, cultural uh, and uh, in other sectors. So that forms the basis of plenaries one and two. The P stand for plenaries. To the then use, so essential P3 is all about brief advice. Absolutely making every contact count with every patient that we come into contact with by whoever is a qualified healthcare professional. We also um, had P4, which talks about other techniques that, patient, that um, professionals can use within the consult. The reason why we, we did that was to give some choice to students in different, you know, in, uh, adapt to different models. But the NHS advice for the United Kingdom and for the European Union was, was please stick to making every contact count, which is what we've done. Essential plenaries five to 12 um, are very much concentrated on what is 90% of the activity that healthcare professionals conduct and, uh, uh, in their day-to-day -day work. And that revolved around seven specific slide sets on non-communicable diseases, but also surgery. We then said, well, you know, some people are gonna be really unhappy that you know, their specialized subject is missing. So we've got a slide set of 10 slides around non-communicable diseases and pregnancy. We've also got a whole set of modules produced by NHS Horizons around this aspect of change agency and strengthening one's individual abilities and capabilities to, to lead. And we've also got a very good textual module written by Dr. Brian Johnson, who is a GP leading on physical activity in the United Kingdom. We want to stimulate curiosity. We want them to consider leading change. We want them to understand the scale of inactivity because it is huge and it carries huge health risks. We want them to be aware of the evidence and we want them to understand the complexity. So those are key themes throughout. And it's not just about physical activity amongst, uh, you know, with individual issues, but requires that linking in that team approach, that, that, that societal and culturally relevant approach that we know transforms systems. So we also wanted it to be much more exploratory around what other people were doing, not only on the national side, but the global side and develop those connections for discussion. So my argument is a rural nurse in Scotland um, delivering physical activity advice has very similar changes to a, a nurse working in Africa, with, you know, in rural areas and what information could be shared for those to enhance clinical practice. Now, I know Drew's going to talk about this, and, uh, um, but we, we have had to focus very, very quickly on what the WHO recommendations are. But I want to do a caveat about that. Yes, it's important that you know the types of exercise specific across the life course and across um, disability and non-communicable diseases. But WHO are very clear. They asked us to strengthen systems which is a systems approach about making every contact count. But the other important thing is about making every influence. So, you know, influencing institutes, in influencing communities that are at risk of non-communicable diseases, which we have done. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. Um, I'm a clinical pharmacist. I'll always be a clinical pharmacist. I've been registered for 38 years. There is not a medicine on the planet that delivers this pl uh, plethora of holistic um, relative risk uh, reductions in uh, non-communicable diseases and chronic diseases. And I think it's important to that medical students, particularly, and schools of uh, med, uh, health students, understand the concept and the context of exercise and physical activity in relation to, um, you know, interventional cardiology or orthopedic surgery. And so we, we start to sort of really focus down on how important this is for students to have the knowledge that they can influence this agenda very clearly. I'm gonna gloss over this because making every contact count is gonna be covered later on, but can we do it? Yes. Can it be done by everybody? Yes. 
And we need to start looking at this holistically. And my comment is, you know, what's the clinic setting like? What's the influence that you can promote uh, across a hospital or a primary care system is absolutely key. Dandelions, which I absolutely love, one of my favourite flowers, but the seeds of change is something that everybody can deliver. And that is the absolute core sentiment across the resources. Everybody can be the difference. And I think the thing about change agency is it's the most inclusive, diverse social movement on the planet. Um, and it means that you can harness new powers, making connections and networks and developing new relationships. And I think by changing our approach from hierarchical, traditional, educational um, and culturally established method or methodology, we're now a, a particular part of Vanguard exploring all of this with the uh, uh, European member states. Something that I'm going to whisk through, but I'm very passionate about, very focused on, is the language issue within a brief advice intervention. So WHO, to be absolutely clear, and all the references are included at the bottom here, and it's backed up by research, do not talk about resistance exercise. Uh, um, and they talk about get strong, move more, break up inactivity. This is a key theme. We add in the information of why students need to know some of the basics to support those uh, connections with their students. And we actually um, endorse all of what um, the um, WHO says, but also what the United Nations say around freedom to play is a basic human right. I'm just going to whiz through these. So this is um, another um, across the life uh, WHO guidance language again, be physical active, get strong, move more with the rationales to back that up within the consults. Um, adults and older adults, be physically active, build strength, improve balance, minimize sedentary time. We expect students to be using this language, not only on their placements, but in the, across their future healthcare career. We want to focus on simple language. Some is good, some physical activity is good, more is better. You could start today, it's never too late. Every minute counts. So we don't focus on step counts. We don't focus, when I say we, the WHO doesn't focus on step counts or anything else. Every minute counts is the global message. And also to highlight the social and mental benefits. And somebody mentioned about mental health in the curricula. That is one of the essential plenaries that we've included in the, um, uh, in the essential um, side sets. We've also underpinned everything around some very key precedents in healthcare, um, non-communicable diseases, the sustainable development goals, the social determinants of health and inequity. We want the students to access the online resources uh, as part of their online studying. We want them to take the questions, the challenges and some of the, the thinking to the tutor groups, the cohort groups, the practice-based learning and interprofessional learning, and also while they're on their placements as well. And we want to challenge the students, and I'm sure our, you know, RCSI is um, well ahead of the, the curve in terms of um, following on with some of these very, very key leadership challenges that we, we want the students to share um, um, uh, as well. And the other thing is to make the difference between this idea of equality, which is sometimes, the, oops, which is sometimes, sorry, have you, um, I think you might have lost me. Um, are you all still there? Yeah, um, yes, and we can see your so, slides, but not the one that you were on. No, sorry, that was, um, I tried to sort that out, apologies, very quickly. Um, we want to make sure that, um, Students really understand this, this transition um, be, between, uh, let me just do, so. yes, are we, are we back? Yes, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, around equality. So equality is one size fits all, which we know within the NHS is, is not such a good healthcare model. What we want to do is provide bespoke, personalised interactions and also increase equity of access to physical activity. WHO has sort of badged this under very four principles of creating active societies, creating active environments, creating active people and creating active systems. But to me, this is about physical well-being. 
mental well-being and individual development, which is very much based within, you know, our culture of societies and the communities that we work in. And so I think it's really important that we reach out to the communities in terms of social prescribing. So we challenge the students to learn more about that and what's available. But I want to say, you know, I've been to Ireland several times. I've been to the RCSI several times. Ireland has absolutely amazing green spaces and wonderful connected communities. So the opportunity to move Ireland into championing physical activity across the board, I think is a very realistic aspiration. And I know, Jennifer, you mentioned some of the issues and challenges of physical inactivity in Ireland right at the beginning. Um, but, um, you know, you guys have it all in terms of green spaces uh, and access to those green spaces. So it's important that our medical students can, can help signpost patients in lots of different ways. And I, and this is, a, I just love this slide because actually this is an RCSI project that was done in 2015 around connecting um, RCSI students very to, to local initiatives. The other thing is about reflection about, well, where is Ireland? Where is England? Where is everything? And this was when we were part of the EU. And we, in, we, we try and broaden um, the students' horizons in terms of what's happening in other countries, which is on the left-hand side, you know, what's happening with promoting physical activity in the healthcare sector, which is obviously what we're interested in today. But also, and quite importantly, what's about promote, what's happening about promoting physical activity in the education sector? And I'm very um, adamant that we should have placements within our community, you know, um, student placements as part of medicine and health within the education sectors, because I think that that's an uh, hitherto untapped resource for promoting physical activity and our connections. Um, we focus very much on the practice based learnings of inequities. I've shown this in England. You can see the north of England. Um, this is physical inactivity is really, really high compared to the south of uh, England. And we ask um, our students in, as part of the resources to look at inequities, to start thinking about what the reasons behind that is and how does this relate to ill health and physical inactivity. So really moving from a pure medical model to cover upstream around prevention and the WHO and the social determinants of health and the sustainable development goals as well. Um, and we also focus on some hitherto um, uh, really poorly served um, inequitable populations such as intellectual disabilities, where certainly in the UK access to healthcare is very poor. Um, there's there's um, ad hoc support and signposting within healthcare, and yet the physical and mental need to get active against non-communicable disease risk is extremely high in um, intellectual disabilities, and there's very little action. And indeed, even in physiotherapy courses, um, there's very little emphasis on intellectual disabilities um, in the United Kingdom. So we try and harness some of the patient's enthusiasm for meeting the needs of all their patients uh, as part of the resources. So in summary, every move counts. That's what the WHO asked us to strengthen within the undergraduate curriculum. Every move counts. And in terms of capacity building, and fulfilling the dreams and aspirations of the nations along the lines of health is wealth, then we felt that it was incredibly important for our healthcare professionals of the future to make every contact count, but also to strengthen their leadership in making every influence matter. Does this matter at scale? Yes. Those everyday conversations, effective conversations with our patients and with our communities are essential medicine. A qualified doctor, nurse, midwife or allied health professional may see half a million patients across their entire professional career. That has enormous potential for advocacy and the promotion of physical activity. And indeed, when we frame it in that way, the students um, have given wholehearted support for the caring and sharing and networking around a global movement for movement and sharing physical activity uh, in a whole variety of methods. This is the cohort uh, from the University of Nottingham. And just to summarize, so essential criteria for those future healthcare professionals, background, context, um, key skills in essential three, P3 around making every contact move, 
and delivering on the agenda of ill health uh, and also um, around mm -hmm. surgery. Harnessing the student's ability to use the hashtag movement for movement on Instagram, you know, all varieties of social media, uh, but also within the context of any uh, projects that they run themselves with the purpose of being competent, capable and confident within those parameters. And most importantly, to raise the aspirations of society and the institutions uh, responsible for health and well-being so that we can help fight social isolation, improve community well-being. Uh, and my, my question is, what's not to like about all of this? Um, but most importantly, leading on implementation and sharing the ideas. Now, I have to say, it, does it take a village to, 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 to have delivered the vanguard? Yes, it does. Um, Vanguard's absolutely um, been an enormous project uh, to lead on with uh, Professor George Metzios from Thessaly. And I just want to say a special thanks to all the people that have uh, contributed to the community of practice, but especially thanks to the patients and the families and the carers for their insights into what's needed in the context of teachable moments with our patients, and also to champion all healthcare students in their future change agency. So thank you very much. We couldn't have done this without all the input and all the connections across the EU member states. Uh, and I'd just like to say a thank you to the design team we were very explicit in our medical education content in, in ensuring that we sourced at all times equitable and non-stigmatizing images. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Anne. And for anybody that's joined late, just a reminder that we'll keep the questions until the end, so after the last speaker. But if you do have any questions, feel free to add them to the Q&A uh, box. So our next speaker is Orla McGowan, who's the Head of Training and Programme Design for the HSE Health and Wellbeing Healthcare Strategy. And Orla and her team are responsible for supporting the implementation of the Making Every Contact Count programme in the HSE. So welcome, Orla. Um, you should be able to share your slides. Yeah, I'm just gonna see if I can do that now. Um, Cool. Okay, can you see that now? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, great. So thank you, Jennifer. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so um, as Jennifer said, my name is Orla McGowan. I'm the Head of Training and Programme Design within HSC Health and Wellbeing. And um, just to say, either are kind of two aspects to my role. Um, there's the making, supporting the implementation of the Every Contact Count programme. And then the other side um, is in relation to the education sector. So implementing um, um, health and wellbeing initiatives, supporting the implementation of health and wellbeing initiatives in uh, preschools, um, primary schools, post-primary schools, and in third level. Um, and just to say, I know the Healthy Campus initiative was mentioned earlier and as a way of driving physical activity, which is great. Uh, that was a piece of work that uh, we were involved in the development of and um, looking forward to, see what, to seeing what comes back from HEIs in relation to that piece. Um, but for today, I'll just talk about the Making Every Contact uh, Count programme and how it's run within the HSE. So, um, so I guess to start off, like, so making every contact count is essentially about culture change in the health service, where health professionals start conversations about lifestyle and behaviour as part of routine care. And the aim is to encourage behaviour change and to reduce the rates of chronic disease that we have. So as you know, uh, chronic disease accounts for 40% of all hospital admissions um, and 75% of hospital bed days. Uh, we have um, almost 40% of adults that have one chronic um, condition and um, about 10% have two or more chronic conditions. Um, and over half of adults aged over 65 have two or more chronic conditions. Um, so the, the trends based on current rates of um, overweight, smoking, alcohol intake, um, 
we are, it's, it's estimated that the chronic diseases are set to increase by 40%. Um, which is going to make it very challenging to provide a um, high level quality service um, to patients. So the research, um, as, as Alan has gone through and potentially previous speakers, I only joined uh, for um, Lisa's presentation. Um, so research has found that brief interventions by health professionals are an effective approach to patients uh, changing their risky health behaviour. Um, that, that patients actually expect to be asked about lifestyle behaviour and assume that if they're not asked, that there is no problem. And um, one in 12 patients are likely to increase physical activity levels following a brief intervention from a healthcare professional, which is, which is a very good rate. So they are just some of the statistics around the societal context. So in addition to, like, I guess the HSE has to implement um, a programme like this because it will enable us to provide um, good quality health services to people within in the future. But from a societal context, people want to make these changes too. Um, so the Healthy Ireland survey from 2021, 90% uh, of people wanted to improve their health and wellbeing. And you could see there that 43% want to be more physically active, 24% want to lose weight, 30% want to sleep better. So um, people do want to make these changes. And um, as a result of COVID, during COVID, a lot of these lifestyle behaviours kind of got worse and the people gained weight, drank more, smoked more and experienced a reduction in their mental health and well-being. And just to look at the context, so this is just for in, in, a, in the hospital context. So you can look, if, so for example, if you have a large hospital with you've 2,000 staff, you've each member of staff delivering even 100 brief interventions annually, which is two a week. Um, but that results in 200,000 opportunities to support patients to make a lifestyle behaviour change. And we know that if MEC is implemented at a um, nationally by everybody and becomes part of routine care, we will see reductions um, in chronic disease um, prevention or rates, sorry. So within um, MEC, so MEC is supported um, strategically and through policies. So there's the Healthy Ireland uh, plan, there is the Healthy Ireland and the Health Service plan, the overarching uh, policies and frameworks for improving health and wellbeing. And then we have the um, national framework for the integrated prevention and, ma and management of chronic diseases and living well with chronic conditions. Um, and making every contact count is a foundational element uh, to those pieces. So in terms of Healthy Ireland, Healthy Ireland plans, um, each CHO and hospital group has to develop their own Healthy Ireland plan. MEC would be um, included in all of those programmes uh, and all of those plans. Um, and it is reported on, we have to report on implementation levels of MEC within the health service as part of um, national service plan reporting. So it's, I guess, you know, sub, you know, um, to a very high degree supported by the, by the system um, and it's likely continue, to continue to be so. So this is just to give you an outline of the degree to which um, it's included in the um, integrated depression um, and management of chronic disease. That's the model of care there. So you can see um, in terms of just that the, the foundational pillar, living well with the chronic disease, making every contact count. Um, is included there as being a key uh, foundational um, uh, intervention that um, will enable people that are that currently have a chronic disease to live well with it. So uh, then, so the I guess that is the rationale behind it, why we're doing it, why it's important, and um, how it's integrated into the HSE structures and policies. Um, so in terms of the, then the training for healthcare professionals, which is the, the side of it that, um, that, that I work on, um, the, the training was originally developed, there is, there is an e-learning programme and um, uh, an enhancing your skills workshop that follows the e-learning program. And this, the training is provided currently in the HSE as a, I guess a CPD, um, but there was also work in the early days, maybe two years ago, to integrate it into medical curricula. Um, now that piece of work is being led by the chronic disease program 
um, by Marie O'Brien and, and Orla O'Reilly there. Um, and that's that's not something that, that we're that, that my office um works on. And the other piece that they um work on is the integration of MEC into the GP contract. So it was it, it's included in, in the GP contract for GMS patients. So the model of so, so you know, what, what is it? So this is the model. So as previous speakers have said, um, making every contact count can be a, just brief advice. Um, it can also be a brief intervention um, for people that have um, established lifestyle factors. And then we can also have an extended uh, brief intervention for people that have um, more significant um, health problems. So the e-learning, um, so there are now eight modules, whether well, there, there's, it, it's, it started out with six modules and we're adding two more modules to it now at the beginning of June. So when you do the e-learning programme, um, you have a short um, piece, uh, a self-assessment piece before you start. And then the first module, it's a 30 minute module on an introduction to behaviour change. Um, so it just describes the approach and skills needed to conduct a brief intervention in an effective way. Um, about, it's about recognising the opportunities to raise the issue. Then there are six topics. Each of these are 30 minutes long. We have tobacco free, get Ireland active, uh, mental health and wellbeing, alcohol and drug use, um, healthy food for life and talking about overweight and obesity. And those two new modules, mental health and wellbeing and talking about overweight and obesity, uh, will be available shortly. And then there's the skills into practice uh, module where it, it demonstrates the difference between um, an, an effective brief intervention and an ineffective brief intervention, because it is possible to do ineffective brief interventions. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit and I'll show a video of that later. Um, but I think um, the, the difference there can be subtle in that people can think that they're um, conducting a brief intervention in the, in the right way, um, but, but actually there is um, an approach to it that is more effective and, and it can be easy to get it wrong. So it just, um, it, it, it goes into that in a little bit more detail, just the subtleties of, of getting it right, the actual way to do it and to get it right. And then there's the post-course the post -course, um, assessment. So all of this um, e-learning is available on HSE land for any health professionals that want to uh, undertake it and they get certification when they have done so. So this is just the introduction to the behaviour change module, you know, it's just showing, you know, why are we doing, why do we need making every contact count, it's understanding about behaviour change, how to engage with patients using a structured approach. So the elements of a brief intervention, so um, it's about the five A's, ask, assess, advise, assist, arrange. Um, so the, uh, the idea is that this is the kind of um, approach that's used to talk about um, lifestyle behaviour. So first of all, asking for permission to have the conversation. Could we talk about how physically active you are? Or um, is, you know, we're, we're asking all our patients today about physical activity. Do you mind if we have a conversation? along those lines, that type of patient if it's your first time to meet with them. Then secondly, on advising, on the need for behaviour change. And then just to assess the readiness for the change, you know, how Oh, sorry, Orla, we seem to. I, 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 yeah. So I think I, I think I just fell off here, wasn't it, when I was just doing this? Yeah. 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 We can see in here, Ineto, if you want to share okay. it again. Um, okay. Sorry. I just have to. Yeah. So um, I'll just go back. Oh, it's not letting me. Uh, oh, maybe I have to so I'll give you access again. Can you see my screen now? Um, not yet, no. Okay. Yeah. 
we can see your slides again now. Okay. Um, sorry, no, here we go. Okay. Yeah, perfect, thank you. So yeah, so I was just going through the, the, the questions there. Yeah, so I think I was just on the assess, so the readiness to change. Um, I wonder, you know, how you'd feel about being more active. You know, have you tried to, you know, trying to assess to what degree the patient has tried to make changes before and how they worked out so that you're very much letting the patient uh, talk about their own knowledge, their own experience. And then the assist. So exploring the benefits and the barriers of change, you know, why certain things might be difficult, what they might do to overcome those difficulties. But again, coming from the patient and then goal setting, what they might start out with, what they might try to do first, you know, so, um, you know, joining a walking group or walking with a friend. So when might they start that? Could they start that this week? That type of thing. And then arranging or signposting to additional support um, if that's appropriate. So um, the important um, element of it is taking a patient-centered approach to it. So actively listening to the needs and the preferences of the patients um, being empathic and respectful and non-judgmental, asking permission, as I've said, uh, avoiding telling people what to do and giving ex expert advice on whether they want it or not. The, and the Get Ireland Active module, so just to, so this is a 30 minute module on physical activity. Um, so it starts off with the, the, uh, just a general introduction, then the physical activity in Ireland, just facts and figures around that. Um, how physical activity affects individuals, how it affects your, your brain, your lungs, your heart, uh, your mental health and well-being, um, what helps people to be more active, what you can do to help, and the summary of next steps. So in the what you can do to help, it gives the language around um, you know, how a health professional might respond to normal um, you know, barriers that patients might have in terms of physical activity. So things like, um, oh, the weather is so bad, there's nowhere safe for me to walk locally. Um, oh, I, I, you know, I, I'd like to be more active, but, you know, I have kids and, you know, um, it's, it's difficult to find the time. So it, there's just, so all of the modules give those types of responses that health professionals can, can provide, or gives examples of responses that health professionals can provide that um, mean that they acknowledge the barrier and acknowledge the position that the patient is in, but at the same time, encourage uh, physical activity at the same time. Um, so um, that's kind of the, that's the, the general approach. So then in terms of supporting, a signposting to physical activity supports, um, we have um, a lot of information on the HC website, on the Healthy Eating Active Living program, have um, various resources and um, information online about improving fitness and fitness for um, your lifestyle, your age, all of that. And then we have various booklets, Get Active Your Way, there's local sports partnerships all around the country, there are walking clubs, there's the park run, there's Fit for Life. So there are lots of different um, supports available in the community uh, for people that want to improve their physical activity levels. And then the second part, so after somebody has completed the e-learning, and you do have to complete all of the modules of the e-learning, um, then you can uh, participate in a workshop um, that is around enhancing brief intervention skills. Um, so the workshop can be offered, is offered face to face in the three and a half hours or online in two and a half hours. And workshops um, are, once you've completed the e-learning, you, you are invited to, you know, you're allowed to participate in the workshops. And that's really an opportunity to practice your skills. So, you know, while the theory might be easy, it's, it's actually the practicing the skills of having the conversation. That's, um, that's the, the piece, that, that's the focus of that workshop. And participants generally find that to be really good and really helpful and feel very kind of supported by it and feel that it does um, enable them to, uh, you know, increase their confidence levels in, in uh, carrying out brief interventions for patients. So um, the MEC uh, program in terms of embedding it, I mean, we would obviously like to see MEC embedded into all um, medical curricula. That was the idea from the beginning that it would be. 
um, um, the e-learning bit um, is three to four hours. It is available on HSE land now, but it is also available, I know, on some third level um, at their own sites. I think it's available on the RCSE site, for example. It's available on the um, or, um, RCPI site as well. And there's lots of universities that have, their, um, that, that have uploaded the, the, the files onto their own learning platforms to enable you know, tracking um, and monitoring of students doing it. There are lots of third level stu students doing it on the HSE land platform as well. Um, so we know that there's, there are currently um, students doing it. It's just that we don't know um, we don't have a good overview of that as to where it's been implemented and in what courses and all of that. Um, and obviously, as you know, it is recognised for CPD by a range of professional bodies. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention and um, get in touch. Uh, if you have a query, um, the Making Every Contact Count website is there, um, as is our, um, the general program email address. And I'm um, happy to take any questions as part of the Q&A. Thanks very much, Oya. Um, our final uh, speaker is Dhruv Javan, who's a, a student on the Graduate Entry Medical Programme in RCSI. I'll hand over to you now, Dhruv. Hi, everyone. Um, last speaker, I know everyone's probably tired, so I won't make this too long. But uh... Um, let me know if you can see these slides. Yeah, we can see them. We can see the slideshow version. Okay, grand. Okay, everyone. So I'll just be presenting on the knowledge and confidence in relation to physical activity counseling among recent medical graduates in Ireland. And um, so this is a project uh, myself, Jennifer Ryan, uh, Orla O'Shea, and um, Suzanne McDonough are working on. And as um, yeah, I'll just be presenting on what we're doing. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm originally from Toronto, Canada, uh, and I completed my Bachelor of Science in, in Medical Science at Brock University. Then I went on to do a Master's in Aging and Health at Queen's University. And then, um, yeah, but I've always been passionate about physical activity. Uh, throughout my undergrad, I was a personal trainer a yoga instructor, um, a spin instructor, spin cycling instructor. Uh, and I got my black belt in 2018. So heavily influenced by physical activity. Um, currently, I'm a second year graduate entry medical student at RCSI in the GEM program. And uh, I sit on the panel for exercise and medicine society at RCSI. So this is why I'm involved in the current project that we're doing. So the pro our project rationale, so um, we've all, we all agree, especially with our past speakers have been talking about the importance of physical activity, even during the pandemic, um, it's been so important, but uh, the national guidelines on physical activity for Ireland produced by the, by the HSC and Department of Health uh, that also has been taken with the WHO they advise that adults should engage in at least 30 minutes of moderate to moderate intensity of physical activity five days a week. And those under 18 should also engage in at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity of physical activity every day. So there are these certain requir requirements we should be reaching. However, the current data shows that only approximately 30% of Irish adults meet the recommended guidelines. And only 19% of 10 to 12 year olds and 12% of 12 to 18 year olds meet the guidelines. So it's quite low that um, people are meeting these guidelines and not being physically active. And so uh, how can we change this? And so we realize from studies that people report being more likely to increase their physical activity if they were advised by a doctor to do so. And through physician promotion and counseling, uh, patient physical activity has been enhanced. So showing in the studies that physicians have a key role in influencing their patients on physical activity. Um, despite this current evidence shows there's a deficit in the education and knowledge, attitudes and practice of doctors in the area of physical activity counseling, both nationally and internationally. So we're seeing that doctors um, aren't being taught enough about physical activity and uh, that also then trickles down towards the patient 
and their lack of physical activity. So what our aim is, is to assess the recent Irish medical graduates' current level of knowledge and confidence in physical activity guidelines. And so how we are doing this is through a cross-sectional sur survey of Irish medical graduates between the years 2017 to 2021. Um, aside from demographics, we're asking a, a brief 10 question survey on the, the awareness of national physical activity guidelines for Ireland and the MEC framework, knowledge in relation to physical activity counseling, confidence in relation to physical activity counseling, priority placed on physical activity counseling, and desire for more undergraduate or postgraduate training about physical activity. And so from our current data, we just released a survey um, last week on May 20th, so last Friday. Uh, we've so far had about 53 responses. And um, the data we collected so far is that 57.4% are not aware of the current national guidelines. Uh, 66.7% are not aware of the making every contact count, so the MEC framework uh, guidelines. The median intercordial range rating for knowledge, so knowledge of physical activity was six. Um, so it varies between three to seven on a scale, on a one to 10 scale with one being not knowledgeable of physical activity. So somewhere in the middle. Again, the, the median intercordial range for confidence this time was also six. Uh, vary between four, four to seven on a one to 10 scale where one was not confident. 70% uh, would like to receive uh, more physical activity training during their medical school career. Um, and we asked them specifically where they would like to see physical activity training. And 80% um, said on guidelines, 76% said on ses assessment, and 76% said on counseling as well. And finally, 57% would also like to receive postgraduate physical activity training. Um, so you can see there's quite a demand or people are interested in getting more training on physical activity. And that shows that currently there's not much being taught during the medical school. And so our output is that we actually need your help. So we hope to generate an inter institutional discussion on the topic of physical activity in medical programs like we are doing now. Uh, we hope to develop a student choice model relating to physical activity as a part of a new medical curriculum. And we also plan on sharing survey data to the wider scientific, wider scientific uh, community to help assess developing material for teaching um, relating physical activity education to the medical curriculum. So uh, those of you online right now watching, uh, please spread the word about this survey to any recent Irish medical graduate. So it doesn't have to be from a specific school. If you know anyone who's graduated from 2017 to 2021, we'd be happy to have them fill out the survey, and share their thoughts with us. Um, there is a link to the survey in this slide. And if you have any further questions, you can contact me through email or through the phone. Um, yeah, but that's it. Uh, thank you very much. And just some acknowledgement, Jennifer Ryan and everyone else. Thanks, Ruth. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers for their excellent presentations and the time you've given to this webinar. I really appreciate it. And I'd also like to thank uh, Roma Acosta, uh, Dr. Grace O'Malley and Dr. Ola O'Shea, who supported um, us to organize this webinar. Um, and the webinar will be available on the OCSI um, channel. So you'll receive a link to that after, the, after this 